for the Louisiana Department of Health and Hospitals, a state representative for District 61 in the Louisiana House of Representatives for more than 15 years, and for 23 years, he served as a pastor of Star Hill Church. Mr. Jessen has continually emerged as a leading voice on community change strategies, social innovation, issues impacting boys and men of color, and authentic community engagement. So Mr. Raymond Jessen, we're turning it over to you. Thank you very much, Courtney. I do certainly appreciate the opportunity to share with you. Uh, and I will, on the surface, talk about a really critical principle. Courtney referenced this notion of adaptive leadership. What I would suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, is what I am truly talking to you about is a different framework for understanding the work that is before you. And I would begin my remarks by saying to you that I sincerely believe that the work of the Mayor's Commission on Racial Equity and Inclusion is to mobilize the people of this community to meet the adaptive challenges that are deeply rooted in race, equity, and inclusion. And there are a couple of things that I'd love to, to highlight for you in that statement. Uh, and it is my prayer that the wonderful people uh, who support uh, our mayor president will, will make these words available to you. But understanding your work is about mobilizing the people. It's about mobilizing the people of this community. You yourselves are not to do the work. You yourselves don't have the capacity to do the serious, challenging work that is before you. And so understanding that it's not simply about what you do as a commission, but ultimately the strategies that you birth that are about how this community moves uh, in different ways. And recognizing that the challenges that we face are deeply rooted in race, equity, and inclusion. And these are critically challenging areas that require uh, a, a totally different framework. Uh, I would further suggest to you that in order to effectively undertake this work, you must totally abandon the notion that the systems involved in your work are broken. You are not where you are to fix something that is broken. Because ladies and gentlemen, I would suggest to you that the systems that you will encounter in this work are not broken, but they are performing the way they are because the people in the system, especially those with the most leverage, want it to be the way it is. And so if you go into this with the mindset that you're going to fix some problems here and there that are broken, I would suggest to you that the issues that are at the heart of race, equity, and inclusion in Baton Rouge have been fixed a hundred times in our lifetime, but they keep reappearing because the system is not broken. It is performing exactly as it designed. It is designed. And so this means that as you begin to tug at the rabbles, the threads of these systems, and as you begin to give name to the dysfunctions that actually contribute to the challenges that we see. Uh, Courtney mentioned that you guys are going to be talking about community and police relations. When you, if you choose to become totally transparent in naming the dysfunctions that lead to what we see, you will not be a popular group. <laughs> and so I would suggest to you that you have one of two alternatives. You can be popular and give a wonderful glowing report, or you can be effective and mobilize this community to tackle the issues that are eating at its very core. But in order to accomplish that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you must avoid the temptation to offer technical solutions to adaptive challenges. And, and, and I'd like to take a moment to, to attempt to unpack those words for, 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 for you. Uh, a technical challenge is something that may be complex, 
but has solutions that can be implemented based on current knowledge that's available. And it can be as simple as a pothole. There's a pothole on the street. Well, we have the technology to fix potholes. We actually have a public agency that, as a part of their work, fixes potholes. So we can call and somebody will come and fix the pothole. Problem solved. It may be uh, as complex as a bridge collapsing on a major thoroughfare. And while more complex than fixing a pothole, we still have the knowledge to design and build bridges. It may be heart surgery, very complex, very challenging. But we have knowledge available to solve the problem of fixing a heart. And so we have these technical solutions to challenges that, though they may be complex, are challenging. Adaptive challenges are very different. In adaptive challenges, uh, we are compelled to learn what the problem really is. If a bridge collapses, everybody understands what the problem is. If a pothole appears, everybody knows. If my cardiologist says that I have a bum ticker, then, then we, we know, that we understand what the problem is. But take the subject matter uh, that, that Courtney mentioned today, community police relations. I would argue, ladies and gentlemen, that if I asked 10 of you what is the problem here, I'd get nine and a half different answers. And so it's important that you recognize that we really don't know what the problem is at this moment. And if we believe that we do, then we will offer some simple solution that does not address the real issue that is before us. And so an adaptive challenge requires that we understand the problem because it's complex, it's interrelated. You, you can't begin to address community police relations without getting into issues of, of poverty and, uh, and, 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 and unemployment and police unions and the history of policing in Baton Rouge. All of these are interwoven and interrelated. And so I would argue that as you begin to wrestle with race, equity, and inclusion in our community, that we don't know what the problems really are. We understand the indicators. We understand their manifestations in our communities. We certainly understand the manifestation of poor relationships between commu particularly communities for people who look like me and, and law enforcement. So the problems require learning. The solutions require learning. Ladies and gentlemen, I would suggest to you that all of the easy answers have been taken before you accepted your job. And so there aren't any simple solutions, but they require a willingness to learn. They require putting aside the default answers that you started this work with and being open to learning. But then the, the last thing that I would say about adaptive challenges uh, requiring of you uh, is that most importantly, the work must be done by those who are most impacted. I, I would argue, ladies and gentlemen, that probably the greatest error that you could make is to think that addressing the issues of race, equity, and inclusion in Baton Rouge is your work. It's not. It is the messy, challenging and complex work for the people who live in this community. And if you are to begin your exercise uh, looking at uh, 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 community and police relations, then unless you work in the police department and unless you live in, in, in communities that are experiencing denigrating relationships with law enforcement, it's not your work. 
and you can't fix it for the police department, and you can't fix it for black, brown, and poor people in this community. Ultimately, what you must put forth is a strategy, a game plan, and challenge the people whose work it really is to own it. And my final remark to you, and if time allows, uh, I, I would answer any questions you have. But I will leave you with this. Adaptive challenges, the kind that have multiple stakeholders that are interrelated, that challenge the existing structures and systems and uh, solutions that we have in our toolbox. They can only be addressed through changes in people's priorities, beliefs, habits, and loyalties. Please hear those words again. The change that is necessary to meet adaptive challenges only occurs through changes in people's priorities, beliefs, habits, and loyalties. And as you can quickly deduce, that is messy work without any simple answers. But ladies and gentlemen, I would say to you that that is, in fact, the work that belongs to this commission. I commend the mayor president for establishing this platform. I commend each of you for accepting it. And I leave you by challenging you to understand what your work really is. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now we're going to make a transition around getting the understanding and introductive, uh, introduction to adaptive leadership to how it could potentially be put into practice. So on the line with us, we have Ms. Sharita Harrison, who also works with Metromorphosis, and she will be sharing information with us. And I think I actually just saw that Mayor Broom just joined us, so I want to make sure that we give her some room uh, to be able to give us some comments as well. Welcome, Mayor Broom. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for uh, being on the uh, call. I know we have had a lot that has transpired since our uh, first um, meeting, and uh, let me just go over a, a couple of things that are uh, on my mind as we uh, move forward here tonight. Um, part of our mission, of course, as you know, is to convene and have open and honest dialogue with all of you all as our public and private sector leaders. Um, you know, our goal, of course, we want to promote equitable policies and an equitable culture uh, for our city and for our parish. And so when we talk about racial equity in the city of Baton Rouge, one of the first issues, of course, that has been on the forefront of many individuals' minds um, is the issue of policing. Uh, recently, we've seen a number of incidents that have called into question some of the practices employed uh, by our police during their encounters with citizens. These incidents have given uh, many people concern in terms of how do we rebuild trust between law enforcement and the residents of our community. The principal role, of course, of our Baton Rouge Police Department is to serve and to protect the residents of uh, Baton Rouge. And we know that this job cannot be effectively done uh, without trust between citizens and our law enforcement officials. And so I believe that it's vitally important for us to discuss how we can break down the walls that exist between our residents and our law enforcement 
so we can effectively ensure the safety of every single resident in East Baton Rouge Parish. No singular entity can keep our communities safe alone. And let me say this, I do believe that over the past years, uh, since 2017, we have made strides in uh, progress in terms of closing the gap between law enforcement and the citizens of our community. We've had a very robust community policing uh, initiative that has taken place. But certainly, as I've said consistently, the work continues. There's always room for improvement. Our ultimate goal is to have a stellar 21st century uh, policing effort here in our city, in our parish, with, which benefits not only the citizens of our community, but also benefits law enforcement as well. It's mutually beneficial. And so with that being said, to start tonight's discussion, I'm going to toss it to Sharita Harrison. Ms. Harrison, Sharita. Hello, everyone, and, and thank you, Mayor Broom, for this opportunity, and um, um, thank you for bringing this, this group together to have this, this much-needed conversation, and, and thank you to all of you for taking the time to share. Um, I'm, I'm going to share my screen because, um, because y'all, I was an educator for a long time, and so I just love, like, visuals and my PowerPoint. But it's really for me and not, you know, keep me on track and not for y'all. But I want to share a little bit of information, kind of expand on what Raymond um, uh, brought up, and then um, really open the floor for you guys to have that discussion to kind of talk about this, given the framework. And so um, I'm going to share my screen. And so if you guys nod when you see it, that would be very helpful for me. <clears throat> I, I saw a nod. Is that a nod, Audrey? Yeah. Okay, great. And so um, I, I want to start this conversation um, with saying that I am going to attempt to be as objective as possible as I am presenting this information. And I say that because I think it's important to acknowledge that I am not completely and totally unbiased on this situation. I have um, a, a nephew, uh, my very first nephew, he's 19, and he, um, I love him to death, but he is, he's at that age now where when I talk to him, he doesn't hear a word that I say because he either has uh, like headphones in his ear or he's just not listening. And so now, no matter how many times I call his name or when I raise my voice and I say, hey, do you hear me? And he, he just kind of looks at me like, what, what are you talking about? Are you talking to me? Right. And, and, and my nephew, bless his heart, is a 6'2 and 210 pounds and he wears a jacket all year round in, in the summer. Right. And he lives still with his mom. He's finishing up school. He lives with his mom. And he walks to the, the corner store, which is about two minutes away from his house, nine times a day, I swear. I, I don't know what they sell at the corner store that he's going to buy, but he comes back like with a piece of candy, chip. Sometimes he brings things for his sister. And he walks with those headphones in his ear. And a lot of times, the only thing that he has on him is his mother's debit card because he says to me, I'm saving my money for the important stuff. And so he takes his mom's debit card, wearing his hoodie in 100-degree heat, walking to the corner store with the headphones on, not paying attention to anything that's going around. And I tell you all of that because there is no way I can be completely unbiased in this situation because as much as I love my nephew, he's awkward, y'all. And I can only anticipate and think about what might happen if someone saw him and decided that his daily trip to the corner store wasn't as innocent as I know it to be. 
And so I'm going to try to be objective. But I want to go on record as I'm not completely and totally unbiased. But that's also why I love the practice of adaptive leadership. Because in a way, it demands this very objective view of these wicked challenges that you are facing. Because one of the things that it says, and it, and it teaches us, is that we are First and foremost, a system within ourselves, we bring a set of values, a set of beliefs, a history, a background, and experience that influences the way we operate in a larger system, right? And because we are a system within ourselves and we operate in a larger system, we have to be aware of both of those dynamics. And it gives you two uh, kind of this this uh, two positions through which to view those dynamics, um, and it, it's on the balcony and on the dance floor, right? And so if you think about when you go to a party, kind of like a formal party, right? It's usually in a ballroom, and they may have the balcony. Or if you're more like me and you prefer to spend your time at football games, you can think of the stadium. Uh, seats that are high, the skybox right, and then the football field where the players are. Well, the bottom line is every adaptive challenge can be viewed from two angles, on the balcony or on the dance floor. And adaptive leadership requires that you go back and forth between the two to get a full glimpse in understanding of the challenge before you. And so if you think about what happens when you're on the dance floor or when you're on the football field, right, a lot of times you can see what's in front of you. You might even be able to see what's, uh, you know, on side of you, but you don't, you can't always see the whole stadium, right? You can't see the person who's just walking in. You can't see everything. But if you go up to the top, you have a different view, a bigger picture, right, of the challenge. Mm -hmm. And so that is why adaptive leadership has become the lens through which I practice both my personal and professional leadership because I am not completely and totally unbiased. I am a system within myself, but I have to be aware of both the view from the top of the stadium and the view from the 50-yard line, right? Mm -hmm. And so I want to give some reminders. And Raymond touched on a lot of these. Adaptive leadership requires this balcony and dance floor or uh, skybox and, and in football field view because the challenges that we are addressing are these big, huge, persistent, right, reoccurring, or maybe not reoccurring because they never really go away, but they exist through generations, right? And in, in other countries, they call these wicked problems, wicked challenges, because they have so many moving parts, so many layers, that it is almost impossible to see what the true problem is, because if you think of it like a monster, right, there's all this other stuff kind of hiding what the true problem is. And so these adaptive challenges are um, are huge. And I see somebody asking me if we, you could get a, a copy of these slides, and I can make them available to, um, to um, the mayor's office. But these adaptive challenges are huge. They are large, and they are very, very complex. And they cannot be solved with existing knowledge. They, they, they probably can't be solved with existing resources or technology, at least in the way that they are used or, or today, right? And so there might need to be some reconfiguration in those kinds of things. And, and that's different from these technical challenges, right? These things that we can fix. Um, because these challenges are so big and so huge and so so wicked, right, we understand them as uh, existing 
in a system. And you have to understand adaptive challenges through this idea that the system in which these challenges manifest is performing exactly as it was designed to do for the people it was designed for. And so if these systems are working properly, when you understand adaptive challenges, or one of the ways to understand adaptive challenges is to understand, well, who is the system working for? Who designed the system? Why? And who is it working for? And, and, and beginning to understand who the system works for, then you can explore who the system is not working for. And then you begin to shift the conditions that are holding that system in place. And that brings us to the idea of two, four, and with, right? And so Raymond mentioned what was and was not your work, right? And I think that's such an important notion because there are a lot of things that can be done to a community, and there are things that can even be done for a community. But there is just so much research, both um, data-driven and anecdotal, that says only when things are done with the people most impacted by the issue are those uh, changes needle-moving and sustainable, right? And so you can design something all day. And I think those of you who have children, right, those of you, especially when you have small children, when, when, when they start out, you have to do a lot of things for them, right? And then sometimes they get to the age where you got to start doing things to them because they don't listen, right? But at some point, you can do things with them because they have learned and they have grown. But it's when you do the things with them that you know that they've really taken ownership, they've really learned what you taught, those kinds of things, right? And it's a similar way, I think, with any kind of wicked challenge, any kind of community change, any kind of community work that you're trying to do, when you do it with the people, that's how we know it fits, right? And so adaptive leadership reminds us that we have to do it with the people. And then the last thing that um, uh, adaptive leadership reminds us is that, um, yeah, this is hard because it is not a technical challenge. And the real work is addressing uh, people's beliefs and values and working to change their hearts and minds. If you were on the debate team, you know how difficult that can be. You can't just say something and change a person's mind. We also know that people don't make decisions or choices based on facts, right? We, we make decisions and choices based on emotion and narrative. And so when you think about that, then you understand how hard this work truly is. And Adaptive leadership and adaptive challenges come in a bunch of packages, but there are four patterns that you can always, um, or that, that, that you may recognize. And the first thing is, if it's an adaptive challenge, there will likely be a gap between what people say they value and what they actually do. And so think about it from a standpoint of, of education, and I love to use this one because I spent a lot of time in the classroom, um, not K-12, but I spent a lot of time in adult ed classroom, and, um, and so I know how this works, but think about how many people say that they value education, right? We think it's important, mm -hmm. especially for the children. We have to educate the children and this and that and that, and then how many of the behaviors do we see that follow? will lead us to believe that that's truly what we value, right? And so it would be easy to say, and, and we can take this current kind of crisis with the pandemic, right? It's easy to say open schools, closed schools, no mask, mask. It's easy to say all of that. But when you really think about it, it goes down, to, it comes down to what people really believe, right? And so 
doubt values and behaviors. There are also some competing commitments that we have to be aware of. Competing commitments are important because these challenges are so wicked and they touch so many areas that you have to kind of think about if you change one piece, what's going to change on the other side, right? What is that going to affect? Because none of this is in isolation. None of it is an island. And so if you tinker with one side, you're going to have some effect on the other side, right? And so you have to be aware of competing commitments. Adaptive challenges are filled with competing commitments. And then there's also speaking the unspeakable. Now, this one is interesting, um, and it's mostly applied to uh, organizations or workplaces. But um, it can, it's going to apply. It can apply to our conversation today as well. In in most organizations or workplaces, they have meetings, right? Y'all been to meetings? Kind of shake your head. Let me know you're still with me, right? Y'all been to meetings? And there are usually two meetings, if not more, going on at the same time. There's the meeting that's actually happening according to the agenda. And then there is the meeting that is happening either in someone's head or on the side or through text message or through IM where it's like, well, why are they saying that? I can, right? And so there are these two kinds of conversations happening. Adaptive challenges usually have those two conversations, one that's on, on the surface and one that is kind of not being said. It's just kind of there. It's like, well, we don't want to go there. Well, if we bring that up, we're going to have to, you know, that's a, key, a clue to an adaptive channel. And then the last pattern that you will see in an, in an adaptive challenge is work avoidance. And what that means is when Raymond said that solving or, or working or addressing community and police relations was not your work, it was actually the work of the police department and the community in which they police, right? Work avoidance happens when the people whose work it really is are not doing it, either because they don't believe they can, they don't believe they should, or whatever the reason they think, and, and, they, and, and it usually falls to, oh, that's someone else's work. And as, as great as this commission is, when you guys are working on community and police relations, there are going to be some people, both in the police department and the community, that are going to say, oh, no, that's Dale Flowers' work. That's Dale Flowers in them. They need to fix that. I can't believe they haven't fixed that, right? It is going to become, they're going to displace, they're going to displace the responsibility to someone else. Adaptive challenges are, are typically filled with work avoidance because it's hard work and it forces people to confront some of the stuff that's deep, deep, deep down inside. So I want to pause here because I want to hear from you. And I saw some things in the chat and, you know, I, I'm just not, I can't do two things at once, can't talk and read chat at the same time. But I want to pause because I want to know from you guys, as far as community and police relations go, do you see any of these patterns or do you see um, any of the, um, the, the, the adaptive challenge, the wicked problems, the intersections that we kind of spoke of? And you guys can just kind of popcorn and come off mute for a few minutes. Y'all seeing the connection here? Anybody have something? Anyone? Hi, this is Latonga. Hello. I see, I see that there's a lot of gap between the values. I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble understanding you. Am I the only one? No. No. Everybody's no. I don't think our technology is working good. Okay. 
Is it you? Latanya, if you're talking, we can't understand you. If you could put it in the chat, that would be helpful. While she's doing that, I'll just jump on to say that what you're sharing, it, it resonates. I mean, every point, it feels like you're hitting the nail on the head with the challenges that we face. Um, with the adaptive nature of things here. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Uh, Audrey, I think I see your hand, and then I, is it is it? I'm Jahi. It's name. Jahi. Jahi. I know. And every time I read it, I say it the wrong way, so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but Audrey first, and then Jahi. Audrey, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, I kept laughing because I have two teenage boys, and how you were, how you related it, the two, the four and two and with is was very um, eye opening for me. But I think um, as a white woman who has tried to be an ally, the conversations that I hear surrounding police with white families are very different than what my black friends have had with their children. And so it seems like trying to reconcile two different realities. For me, that's sort of what I'm hoping to listen and hear from you and and Reverend Justin tonight. Yeah, and 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 I'll say I'm I'm gonna summarize just it was kind of breaking up for me too, so I don't know if anybody uh, didn't catch that, but it's just like balancing these two realities because as a white woman, you can see the differences between your your teenage boys and then maybe their friends, right? And and the realities are different, and so how do you um, you know balance that and maybe even help people see that there are two realities? Well, and it oh, is, and I um. I grew up in an environment, I mean, on an Air Force base, so, like, what I'm growing up, what I grew up with is different than what my children are, even though they go to public school, and it's, they're, they're, diver- they're in a diverse environment, we've had lots of conversations about, okay, when you get in the car with your friends of color, their experience driving is going to be different than the one that you're having, mm-hmm. and having that conversation and encouraging other white parents to have that conversation too so that it starts a little bit earlier but it's uncomfortable i think if that's not something you're used to having a conversation around agreed agreed um J- jackie did i say yes. Right? yes yes you did you said it correctly <laughs> go ahead so i really resonate with what you and reverend jetson are saying in this idea that when you have an issue there are 100,000 solutions that have been applied to an issue, but the issues still exist, exist because the systems still exist and the systems have not been changed. And as an organizer, I strongly resonate with that because oftentimes I have seen different groups, commissions, and organizations focus on issues and not the systems. And to me, it sounds as though the adaptive challenge model is very close to the system of change model, which is the model that I learned in grad school. If you want to solve an issue, you have to think about how that issue is connected to other systems. And I'm also seeing how the overlapping between systems of change and adaptive challenges are understanding that some of the challenges with embracing adaptive leadership is more so due to the fact that power is involved. Just like, for example, with work avoidance. Work avoidance may come not necessarily because people are feeling lazy or unmotivated, but because people are feeling as though if they change a certain system, they lose their power. And, we, yeah. and, and when you see power in a binary way, you see it from this idea of, okay, if I help somebody else out, then I lose. And that's a false binary. If you help someone else, you also will win. And also the whole speaking the unspeakable thing, the first thing I think about is the fact that in many situations, whether it be in a meeting or in a Metro Council meeting, legislative session, whatever the case might be in which decisions are being made for a community, sometimes the unspoken 
isn't coming from a malicious place. It's coming from a disempowered place. So maybe the people that are feeling as though they are despondent or are not listened to are the ones who don't have the societal power or the power in that situation. And that could depend on their race, their gender, their national identity, their age, any other identity that may have one person at the top and another person at the bottom. I, I really resonate with this whole model. And I remember watching the video, and the video didn't quite make as much sense to me, but what you and Reverend Judson were saying have resonated very strongly with me. So I thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Patrick? Yeah, I kind of wanted to piggyback. Um, Jackie just, and several people have mentioned um, work avoidance, and I think to me, I think I see a lot of that where, I mean, I think some, a lot of it is people not wanting to give up power. Um, but I think also sometimes there's some laziness that happens too. Um, so I guess something that's been on my mind is I think about the military, right? And if there's an issue, there's a court martial and there's a process and you don't hear military members complain I have a hard job so therefore I did something awful overseas and give me a break and I I guess I've been thinking about that a lot lately how there's this but we didn't sometimes it seems to do the hard work of doing the right thing or just it's well it's hard to stop a fellow officer from doing something wrong and um, I think a lot of it is rooted, rooted in racism and but it also just seems like there's an avoidance to a hold themselves to a higher standard sometimes. Um, and while certainly I understand police officers have hard jobs, um, they chose that job and that calling. And so whenever I, I hear officers complain, to me it sounds like they're avoiding the work or using that as like, a, well, I have a hard job, so therefore it's okay if I do this awful thing and I, you know, I have a cousin in the military and I, if Nick were to do something and accidentally kill a civilian or something in some country, right, there would be consequences and there would be actions. And it just seems, and you wouldn't hear anyone complain, well, like, oh, okay, you had a hard day on patrol, so therefore we'll excuse this, or it's not swept under the rug maybe as much, not that it doesn't happen, but it seems to be an avoidance of doing the work and just kind of, well, I have a hard job, so therefore it's okay. If that makes sense, like not accepting of responsibility. It, it makes totally sense. And remember, I'm not totally in, in, in completely unbiased here, but um, I, I think it's all of that, right? And so one of the things, um, adaptive leadership, and when you, you, you look at it through this lens, you make room for the fact that it's everything, it's all of it, right? And so having um, <clears throat> one, one explanation is not going to truly adjust, uh, address the issue, but that doesn't mean that that piece of the explanation is not important to the, to the big picture solution, right? And so, yes, I do think there is an element of, of um, a lack of accountability, right, on, on the part of the police, some police officers not wanting to be, um, be held to a higher standard or not wanting um, to, to change the way they do things, right? But then there also might be this element of feeling powerlessness, right? And, and I want to, to say this, this is, again, um, in an attempt to be completely objective, the, the police officers can feel powerless as well, because remember, they are in a system, right? And if the system in which they are working and, and, and exist has this gap between values and behaviors, right, then now they have competing commitment, right? And so it, it can be all of that. It can be lazy police officers. It can be powerless police officers. It can be powerless community, community members, and it can be lazy community members, right? And so making room for all of that helps you to truly frame the, 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 the real issue. One last comment before I move on. Anybody? Anything? 
Maria, is that what's on the Marie? I'm sorry, y'all. I need glasses. Maria, are you you want to talk? You're on mute. No, Maria. Okay. I can share you, one thing uh, really quick. All right, I think uh, it's Rebecca and then Tiffany. Is that right? Go ahead, Tiffany. Okay. Okay. Hi, guys. So, um, th yeah, th this has been very, very eye-opening for me, and I wanted to, uh, I wanted to clarify something. So, you you refer to the word, is it wicked? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's a that's a powerful word. Yeah. <laughs> that's a term that they use in like Australia and New Zealand when they're talking about these adaptive challenges. They call them wicked problems or wicked challenges because, I mean, and, and whenever I think of wicked, I think of like monsters and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And that's what they call them because they're just, they just never go away. And, you know, no matter what we've tried, it hasn't worked just yet. And so they're working on these kind of um, uh, systemic approaches to, mm -hmm. to, to addressing them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, then... One of the things that I wanted to, I guess, I, I just want to speak it then. I guess, you know, you said speak the unspeakable. Um, one of the things that I want to make sure that, that we speak and that I haven't heard a lot of people speak of is when it comes to um, abuse of power within police engagement with the community, um, how that directly affects women. There's a lot of women. I know that there, there are women on this commission that have been directly affected by police brutality and misuse of power. And there, as, as usual, we normally are silent because it's a very, um, it's a very delicate issue and there's a lot of trauma behind that, which I think affects a lot of things. And I, I think, um, you know, I, I think of my young, my young children as well. I mean, I, I have millennials, and I, I think of the young children that they have brought into the fold. You know, I have uh, multi, um, multi generational, um, multiracial kids that call me mom, and we talk about all these things behind the scenes a lot. But what we very rarely get a chance to publicly state is that how women are affected by what has become a systemic uh, abuse of power. And, and women need to be able to feel like they have a safe place to share their stories so that we can do adaptive leadership. But if they don't have a safe place to tell their stories, we really won't be able to know where those uh, problems lie. Yeah, and, and Tiffany, and thank you for, for, for speaking unspoken. I, I, I think that is a great example of, of where I want to go next. And because Courtney has given me the signal that said I'm talking too long, I want to make sure I get to this because I want to leave you guys with this. And then, um, like I said, I'll share the slides. And honestly, there's not many more. But I will also make my contact or uh, Courtney can make my contact information available if you guys want to um, ask further questions. Um, um, Brene Brown, who does some work on courage and leadership, has this concept, and I, I believe she borrowed it from some other literature, but don't we all borrow everything from everybody else? And so she has this concept called the story we tell ourselves. And the story we tell ourselves refers to this idea that we already have a narrative about what the problem is, why that problem exists, and who that problem impacts, right? Right. And so, Tiffany, to your point, when we're talking about police and community relations, um, as Raymond said, if he asked 10 of you guys, we'd get about nine different answers, but they'd be answers that you guys already had, that you brought in, right? And until you uh, have a conversation with someone else, uh, Tiffany, right, it may not have occurred to you that women also are impacted by this uh, police and community relations, right? And so the story we tell ourselves is part of us as a system, but it's also part of the, the conditions that hold um, 
uh, systems in place, right? And so if I continue to tell myself the same story that this is the problem, this is why it's happening, and this is who it is impacted, then I don't have to think about anything brand new. I don't have to think about a new solution. I don't have to reconsider my values. I don't have to do any of that because I already know the problem and I already know the solution, right? And so the story we tell ourselves is an acknowledgement of the fact that we're telling ourselves a narrative that is influenced by our own experiences. And so Brene Brown would say, um, when you are in a, a, a like a, a conversation, an uncomfortable conversation, Audrey, you might say, the story I am telling myself is, and then you state your perspective. And what that does is it allows the other person to correct the story because we may or may not be right, right? What I want us to examine for however many minutes I have, Courtney, um, what is the story you are telling yourself right now about community and police relations? So if you have some paper handy, that would be helpful. If you don't, you can just think of it. But if I ask you the question, why are relations between the community and the police so strained? What's your answer? You can write it in the chat if you want. You can uh, write it down. But I want you to have an answer before I ask for a couple of examples. And I'm going to figure out how I can read the chat while my screen is being shared as well. But the question is, why are relations between the community and the police so strained? Why? Can I can I give you I my answer? Um, can I go next after she does? Okay, one second. Y'all have it written down somewhere. And don't just make it up off the top of your head. You got it? Well, no, ma'am. I have experience, so it just comes off the top of my head. Got it. Got it. Okay. You, you, okay. So we'll go with and see. It's Tara first. Yeah. Then who said they got it? Who else? All right. We'll go with Tara. Then Son Sonja, Sonia, and then Tiffany. If you have one. And then I'd love to hear from a new voice. John, you have one? Okay, let's go. Why? Why? Okay. How you doing, Sharita? My name is Tyra Mitchell. I am a student representative on the committee to represent Baptist I'm the SGA president. And from my experience, do I have an echo? Yes, you do. What about now? Nope, you're good. Okay. Okay, so from my experience growing up in the urban neighborhood, hood and both be, being African American, it's basically because of one reason I can give, one very good reason is racial stereotyping. What the police do can is I they do the book. No, I always they, do this. Go ahead. I get so excited. What, they, what so they do, I feel like what they do is they judge books by its cover. Okay. Because I've had times where I was stopped just walking up the street to the store and they thought my cell phone was a gun. So I could have immediately gotten shot for holding yeah. the cell phone. Good. And can I pause you? Because this activity, uh, I want to kind of popcorn it a little bit because then I'm going to ask, I'm going to come back to you and ask you a question. So racial stereotyping, let's see, Sonja, you had your hand up. Yes. What's the reason? I said a lack of trust on both parts, the community doesn't trust the police and the police doesn't trust the community that they serve. Perfect. Um, Tiffany, did you have one? Uh, yes, yes, I do. Um, trauma and distrust. Uh, you know, for people that have been negatively impacted or had a negative experience, it becomes a traumatic event and it, it permanently affects the relationships Okay, uh, can I get one for the sake of time? I, I have one. I, I think fear on both parts. Fear. 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 Okay. So, the story we tell ourselves, I'm sorry, there's an echo. Okay, we got it. Okay, the story we tell ourselves is that uh, the relations between community and police are so strained because A, racial stereotyping, B, lack of trust, three, trauma, four, fear. Now, the question is why? 
Why is there racial stereotyping, Tara? Why is there a lack of trust? Uh, who said that? Sonia? Yeah. Why is there a lack of trust? Why is there trauma, Tiffany? And why is there fear? Was that Frank? Miss MacArthur, that was you? Why? Yes, that was me, fear. Um. Now, take 30 seconds to answer the question, why? Why? I, I think it's racial stereotyping on the behalf of the history that the police are in the black community already have, starting okay. with police brutality, like, for example, Rodney King. Okay. They're, they think we're all basically not, I'm not going to say all of them, but basically we're all criminals in their eyes. Perfect. And if you ask me, it has a lot to do with the way that they are trained to react to certain situations. Oh, I'm going to use that one, too. You kind of went ahead. And so I can go around the and ask you all, for whatever your first reason, I could ask you five why and get you down to what the root cause is. And when you get to that root cause, that is likely your adaptive challenge, right? And so racial stereotyping is probably an issue. Right, it is probably impacting the relationship between communities and the police. But if we keep going and keep asking why, we eventually get to the root cause, and that's the adaptive challenge that we have to address. Otherwise, we're still going to see what we think is the problem, right? And so, if we take uh, Tara's example. There's racial stereotyping. Why is there racial stereotyping? Because of the history between the community and the police. And it's also because of the training. And then if we went, why are they trained that way? Because of this. It's probably the this that we need to work on if we're going to see any real change. John, you look like you really want to say something. John? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm glad that uh, the concept of history came up because I think the, the way I see the adaptive challenge is just that, well, Baton Rouge Police Department was founded in 1865 by, the, by a mayor who was actually a mayor during the course of slavery in Baton Rouge. He was a mayor while slavery was still legal in Baton Rouge, and then he became the mayor again immediately at the end of the Civil War. So he was the mayor who established the RPD. Uh, there was a, a unit, a group, a militia force called the Patrol that existed in Baton Rouge in the 1800s and existed all the way up till the Civil War broke out. So you can actually go back and look at it and see these things in a way in which, well, there's this thing called incremental changes, incremental growth in which organizations continue along the path of which they were organized. There was already a group here outside of the constable called the Patrol who was active and operating in some of the same communities where Black Baton Rougeans live today. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, look, <laughs> where's the book coming, John? All right, Rebecca, what, what, what do you say? Um, I just want to piggyback off of what John said. I'm just, I think, we, you know, getting to the root of the challenges here, we need to look at the history and see how these systems were founded and then call it racist, mm -hmm. we can call it what it is. And I, I don't know if this is a layer to those challenges or a separate adaptive challenge in and of itself. But what I found in trying to speak and engage with people in my white community, one of the challenges I face is they don't even want to acknowledge the adaptive challenge. Like if it, it doesn't affect them or exist for them, then they can't believe that it's real for other people. And I feel like that's an adaptive challenge in and of itself. It is, Rebecca. So thank you for, for pointing that out. And if I had more time, y'all, I, I promise, I mean, Courtney, I don't know. I don't know. I, you know, I can't start talking and then stop. But I, if I had more time, I would talk with you about, yes, that is an adaptive challenge, but it's, actually, it's also a layer into every other adaptive challenge because part of what you have to do is call people's attention to what they say they believe and then how they're mm -hmm. acting. And and doing that, you're not. And as Raymond said, you're not going to be popular. There are some tools for doing that, but but that is a good point. I want to end with one thing because I think it's going to be very important for you guys going forward. The five whys is one of the easiest um, tools you can use to really examine what the root cause of an issue is. 
And also, side note, for you parents, it works on children, too. When you ask them why five times, all of a sudden, their ideas don't seem so great, right? And they're like, well, I don't know why I want to do it anymore kind of thing, right? But the five whys, getting down to the root cause, um, is so important for finding the true adaptive challenge because otherwise you run the risk of addressing symptoms and not what's really at, at the, 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 um, the core of the issue. And if, if we had done the lack of trust or the trauma or the fear, we could have asked why several times to get down. What is the root cause of the fear between police officers and the communities that they police, right? If we ask why five times, we'll get to that. And it is likely that our adaptive challenge is, a, is there, right? Not at the surface, but under those five whys. I want to leave you with a definition of adaptive leadership that also serves as a framework for how you can conceptualize your adaptive challenges. The definition of adaptive leadership is it is the practice of mobilizing people to tackle tough challenges and thrive. And Raymond probably went over this, but I want to do it again because I think it's so fundamental to this work. The practice of mobilizing people. I'm sorry, I went ahead, but it's the same. The practice of mobilizing people. Your work is to make sure that the people whose work this really is are bought in and working with you to address the issue. So first and foremost, you are mobilizing folk, right? You're getting people together. You're helping them understand what the issue is. Um, Rebecca, you're calling attention to the issue because sometimes people don't see it or they don't want to see it. So you're mobilizing. And then they have to tackle the tough challenge. If they're not tackling the tough challenge, then y'all will just have another commission in about 10 years because we're going to have the same challenges if we're not uh, uh, tackling the tough one. And then um, the last piece is thrive. There is a real emphasis in adaptive leadership that the people who are impacted by the challenges have to thrive at the end. It is not enough. To, to, to remove the challenge and the people still, you know, in a bad position. When I was teaching adult ed and I was working in the GD program, one of the things that we talked about was after we got our students, after our students passed their GED, they went back to their job and McDonald's making the same amount of money. And we were like, well, well what did we do? I mean, now they have, now they have a, a, a GED, but we haven't changed their lives, right? And so adaptive leadership puts a focus on the after the challenge has been addressed, are the people better off? And so for you all, whatever your adaptive challenge is, you can use this definition as a framework. Your adaptive, your adaptive leadership is the practice of mobilizing who to tackle the tough challenge of what so that they will thrive. And it helps when you define thrive because then you know what you're working for. Is it just that people feel safe or is it just, or, or not just, is it that people feel safe? Is it that people are seen as in their, for their human worth, right? What's thrive? It helps when you define that. So I will stop there. Courtney, I don't know if I have time for questions. You can tell me no. But I will share these slides and my contact information. And um, thank you all so much. Um, I know it's a lot, but thank you so much. No, thank you, Sharita. Thank you so much um, for invoking some thoughts and um, different mindsets in all of us that we'll use as we continue to work through this. We will take three questions because I do think it's important to get some framework around this, and then we will move into the individual room. So here's what I'll start with before we take those three questions. Each of you have been sent your work group link in an individual text message from the engagement host. You've been given a link from your engagement host, and you also have that link in the email that you were sent at 3 p.m. today, but it may be easier for you to just go into the chat and click that link. So after the three questions, we will break directly into those rooms 
for the last 20, uh, last 15, 10 to 15 minutes of conversation so we can uh, work in our groups and talk about next steps and how we will start to adapt and work through some of these adaptive challenges. Are there any questions? We'll take three. Courtney, I just have a comment. This time, Mitch, I didn't receive a text message for the working group session. It will be in your chat. So if you go to the chat, there will be a link there. And if for some reason that you don't have a chat, you'll be able to go to your email to get it. Okay. And when you All right. chat, it was sent directly to you individually. Okay, I still don't have it. No problem. So we'll have Helen connect with you individually. All right, thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Yes, I, I have one question. Um, when, it, when it comes to uh, taking the bird's eye view or the view from the stadium skybox and the view from the field or level, and then moving from one to the other, is there a, a practice to help folks move from, okay, I'm here on ground level and I need to rise to bird's eye view to take a look, or I'm at bird's eye view, I need to go down and take a look from the level field. Is there a method, something that can help folks learn how to move from one to the other so, so we, we don't remain either at the bird's eye or at ground level? Thank you. That, that's a really good question. And so um, a lot of it, and this is not going to be a great answer, but I'll try. A lot of it is intuitive, right? And so if you are working on a particular challenge, right, and you are this is, I don't know, and you are making some progress, right? And you are not being met with challenges, it is likely that you're missing part of the big picture. Because remember, adaptive leadership is about changing people's, people's habits, calling attention to uh, the inconsistencies in their values. It's about requiring them to do something different. And so, if everybody is on board with you, you are probably working in a, a very, very narrow lane. And it's time to step mm -hmm. back and say, what am I missing, right? Because I certainly should have uh, faced some resistance from it. And the practice of adaptive leadership has you identify your allies. It has you to identify your distractors. It has you identify these groups of people, and none of them are enemies. They're just groups that you have to be aware of because they're going to play a role. And so, for instance, if you are not being, you know, no one's knocking on your door saying, how dare you try to change this, you're probably not addressing the big thing, right? On the flip side of that, if you are um thinking and working in all of the big picture and you're failing to get people to mobilize because they don't understand what you're trying to do, you've probably been up in the balcony too long and you've lost touch with the people down on the ground. And so a lot of it is intuitive, um, but it's informed by the understanding of all adaptive leadership. Does that make sense? Um Okay, yeah, sorry if that's not a great answer, but it's kind of what it is. Once you kind of understand the things that are at play, you can say, oh, I need to step, take a step back and I need to do it this way, or I need to do it this way. Kind of thing. Other questions? That's good. Charita, Charita, you hear me? I do hear you, but I can't, I don't know who's talking. Who is it? Is it Maria? This is Mar Maria, I tried to ask you a question for a long time. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Uh, what What do you recommend with individual perception? You know, the person of the own individual perception associated with the past experience, education, whatever, a, a racist profile. How do you deal with trying to modify the individual perception to work to our goals? Yeah, okay. Well, Maria, so again, if I had that answer, I'd like to think that I'd probably be like a millionaire. 
Because I think what happens, and you're raising a good point, because we, again, we're a system and we have our own experiences and we come from um, different backgrounds, right? And our perception is, is key to how we interact in the world. It's a survival mechanism. Our brain works um, on perceptions and shortcuts. If we had to think through every little thing, I mean, we die before we got out of bed in the morning, right? And so... It's our, 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 the way our individual perceptions work are, they, they are important. However, when we, when you are addressing a, a, a wicked challenge, sometimes individual perspectives can be problematic, right? How do you convince someone that something that they've experienced and maybe lived for 30 years is not exactly right, right? It, that, that's hard work. Um, and it's also complicated by the fact that we're not logical people in just at heart, like we're not, right? We, we like to think that we make decisions based on facts and numbers, but we don't. We make decisions based on feelings, <laughs> stories, and actually our brain works in narrative form. And so the short answer to your question is the only way to change, mm, you may not change individual perspective. There will be people individually who just will not shift your practice, your leadership, your work has to be with adjusting the system or the conditions that keep the system in place. And so let me see if I can well, come up with Go ahead. Who's talking? Oh, I thought somebody was. Let me see if I can come up with an example. So um, if you think about it, there are going to be some people who do not believe that they need to wear a mask. You can show them every infographic. You can give them data. You can, and, and their minds are not going to be changed. However, if there was a system in which wearing a mask was more, I'm sorry, if there was a system in place in which wearing a mask was created more problems for them than wearing the mask, then they may comply even if their minds don't change. And so that's the difference between trying to approach it from an individual perspective of and a systems change. Some people, some individual perspectives will never shift, but you can't, your, your work can't be on changing the mind of one person. It's got to be changing the mind of the collective. Um, yeah, that's what I got. And if I have one more question, it's probably not going to be a great, <laughs> a great satisfactory answer either, but I'll take one Jada. more. Yes. Jada? Yes. Yeah. What is a good way? a good nonviolent way to get those in power who may not want to see change to come to the table? Um, well, so let me say this. Most people resist change. They're not opposed to change. They are opposed to loss. And a lot of times, Change represents loss to people. And so when you approach someone and say you want to make something different, what they hear and see is what they're about to lose. And so mm -hmm. to get them to the table, it helps to frame it in not what they're about to lose, but what they stand to gain or how things can be best. That's good. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that's sometimes hard on, on the people who are trying to bring people together because now you got to think, you got to put yourself in their shoes and you got to think about everything. And then sometimes it feels like manipulation because you're like, well, I know if I say this, they're going to, you know, that kind of thing. It's hard. You have to frame the change as a game and you have to get rid of, help them get rid of the notion that they're about to lose something. And so think about how when we invite people to the table, 
our flyers or, you know, it's time for a change or we need something different. Let's do something different. People don't want different. They like what they have, right? The only people who want different are the people who are not doing well, right? And so if you're trying to get people who are not, uh, who are, who are in power, who are doing well, you've got to start framing change in terms of what's in it from this, from, for them and what they say in the game. I like that. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, that I, I, I think that's the last, um, yes, it is. that I can take. Um, it is. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> no, no problem. And thank you so much, Sharita. This is clearly, clearly uh, a very engaging dialogue and conversation. And commission members, this is not the last time that Sharita will be engaging with us. We'll share more about that very soon. And I will share her contact information as well so you can stay connected to the work that she's doing personally as well as with Metromorphosis. So the time has come for us to talk about how you as commission members will mobilize to tackle the tough challenges of your respective work group areas, which are government entities, education, human services and health, arts, culture, community engagement, and community development, and economic development. And then lastly, there's the historic recognition group as well. So there are links. We've shared them again. I believe there was a technical difficulty. So there is a link. If you go in the chat, there is a link that is there for everyone. If you look at the chat with everyone, there is a link for each group that you can go to. The rooms are open and your respective liaisons are already in the room waiting for you. This room will remain open until everyone transitions over. So you'll be able to click that link and it'll transition you over. So everyone, thank you so much for joining again and let's start to make the movement over to your individual rooms. And you can simply click the link and it'll allow you to do so. Where is the link? It is in the chat. So if you click the dot, there should be a link for the chat for you to go into it. You can also check your email and it will come to you earlier today too, where we'll break out of our individual groups. I click my chat, nothing happens. So I need to go back to the email, I guess. Or you might, it might have been a pop-up box that popped up behind your current screen. Sorry, I'm getting a bad echo. Uh, get out of my current screen. The I'm just saying the pop-up box joined the next group. It might have popped up behind your current screen. So I have, I got a, okay, I'm up. All right. I don't, I don't find it either. I'm going to get out and, and go back to my email. I guess start over. The community and economic development one has opened up. If, you, if you're having difficulty finding your chat, if you go to your email, the link is there for you as well. We just reshared the email to everyone, and you can go into your individual work group. Okay, I'm going to leave the event now and go back to my email. Yes, you can. And if you have any questions, just give Helen a call. She's on standby to assist anyone. Yeah. Courtney, so I'm Courtney do you hear me? Courtney, you hear me? Yes, I do. Connie, I went to my email. I went to uh, my education, health, and human service and government, and the event said not started. Same here. I don't know. For the community development and economic development, it says it hasn't started yet. The host isn't there. Yeah. Yeah, I had the same problem here. Okay, hold on one second. So, hey, uh, we we are waiting for the host. Same here. Hi, um I'm trying to get to my, because for some reason my app restarted, so can I get the link to my particular group, please? Hey, if you go to your email, the link. Yeah, is every, every click it, it says it's looking for a password. 
and the passwords I've tried are not working. Okay, hold on one second. I'm going to have Helen reach out to you directly. Okay. I tried to click the link, Courtney, and it said the meeting has not started. Sure. Hold on one second. I'm actually calling so we can get that together. Hold on. You, you click the link in your email. Okay, Helen, if you can, let's go one by one to the folks in here. Jahi is looking for his link. If you can send him his directly in the chat right now. Helen, I'm going to leave you in on this side because I have to go ahead and work with the other group. Helen, can you confirm you're going to send everyone their links? Okay, thank you. Patrick, which group? So, Helen. Which group are you in? Uh, community Arts and Nonprofits. Yes, sir. Okay, and did you try to click the link that was in the chat, or you didn't have that? Complete? I tried, or I missed it. One of the, and I tried to click it in the email, and it said the meeting hadn't started yet. So. Um, I tried to reopen it to try again and I lost the chat. Oh, but, okay. Yeah. Okay. And I tried from the email and it said it hadn't started. Try that, Patrick. Did you email it or? I just put it in the chat. Did it pop up? No, but I'm not great at technology, so it okay, could be. If you're looking at your screen on the right side, or at the bottom, um, I need to the little blue bubble with the chat button. Okay. Me. Blue button. Oh, sorry. There we go. But me. Important tool for her and her administration. So, um, in addition to economic development, I Mr. Carl, do you have your link? 
Oh, you're on mute, Carl. Hold on. Uh, I've clicked on it a couple of times, but it's still showing that it hasn't been started, so I can't join it. How about? Yes. I got it. Pardon me? Did you see the Did you see the chat pop up that I just sent you? Um. I guess is it. All right, Where so you want to send? Click on this new link. Is what you're saying? Yes, sir. Try that link. Okay. It's telling me to reinstall WebEx, which I don't think is needed, is it? H, does it have an option for you to run a temporary application? Um, no. Okay, you may need to add the um add-on. Okay, but I mean, I, obviously I already have WebEx installed. I've been in the meeting all night, right? Yes, sir, but it, sometimes it's different because this is an event and that is a meeting. Um, so you may need to leave the event and try and download on that meeting. Hey. <laughs> I think it's here. In the install. And again, the echo was gone. Um, it must be a glitch with the, with the program. So I'm muting everyone. everyone so everybody I'm going to mute you. And please, please unmute yourself if you need to. We're just going to break down some information of that. I'm muting everyone now. Go ahead, Vinny. No, actually, Courtney, while you were trying to fix the tech, which it seems like you, you guys have. Um, I was actually going to go over expectation setting, but did you want to go over, over some of the uh, questions? Um, and then you can go, ahead, team on going with this. You can go ahead okay. and get started. I, I want to navigate making sure that everybody's muted. Go ahead. Yeah, so I want to be sensitive to time because it's going to happen. But, you know, one of the things that we really didn't discuss last week or two weeks ago, rather, is... I'm here nothing but a lot of feedback. feedback. Is this better? Better? Yes? Fine. I think it's better. Yeah, it sounds good for me. Okay, so uh, we're gonna try this again. So one of the things that we really didn't talk about, um, I don't think we talked about at all, was sort of the expectation setting that we want as we start to spend really the next 